I'm Robbie Thigpen, and welcome to the Sargassum Podcast. I'm Jenna Contuccio. And I'm Francesca Elmer, and we are your hosts for today. We are going to share with you the latest ideas and concepts about Sargassum and Sargassum beaching events, which have become an international challenge. Let's get ready to learn together. Welcome to another Splendid Evenings. <laughs> entertainment with uh, Dr. Kate Mansfield. She is an associate professor and director of the Marine Turtle Research Group in the, in the biology department of uh, the University of Central Florida there in Orlando. She was hired in 2013 to take over the, the Marine Turtle Research Group, the uh, which is a legacy program and a long-term sea, re, sea turtle research lab. Dr. Mansfield trained as a marine scientist and turtle biologist and started working with sea turtles in 1994. Um, she's from Kentucky and all the bluegrass state. And since she left there, she has since worked on various sea turtle research projects with an initiative with state, federal, academic, and private groups up and down the U.S. East Coast throughout parts of the Caribbean, Central and South America, and in the Indian Ocean. And she's just about to be one of the, the photographic contributors for the uh, for Marine Conservation Without Borders uh, Indigenous Education Program. And uh, anyway... Under the direction of Dr. Mansfield, the UCF Marine Turtle Project Group examines sea turtle biology, ecology, behavior, conservation across all life stages of sea turtles from eggs to adults. And with that, we're going to ask you our first question today. And this is a question we ask everybody because this is the Sea Turtle Podcast. It's a sargassum podcast. And we know this it's having a lot of effects on a lot of different systems and all this stuff and species and whatnot but for you what does sargassum mean to you personally well thank you very much for having me on your podcast i'm excited to be here and sargassum is kind of a mystery to me in a sense that i'm still on the learning curve learning as much as i can about sargassum because it's really important for an early life stage of sea turtles but my first encounter with sargassum was well before i even worked with sea turtles and it was back in college i did a semester program sea education association and i up until that point had never been offshore or offshore for any length of time and Growing up in Louisville, Kentucky, you know, I had access to the beach on vacations, but I just thought of the ocean as this big, huge expanse where there's not much going on at the sea surface. And that perception completely changed when I was in college and spent six weeks offshore on a 134-foot brigantine learning how to sail and sample and do all sorts of neat oceanographic work. And... I was blown away and it completely changed my perspective, just being out offshore, seeing sargassum, seeing what lived in sargassum, seeing the, you know, being a thousand miles offshore and then seeing fish show up out of nowhere underneath the boat or uh, seeing little uh, juvenile fish around sargassum or doing uh, some trawling and catching, you know, some sargassum and sorting through it and seeing so much life in it. So sargassum to me is fascinating, I guess, and it is kind of representative of what I don't know and what I still need to learn. I love that take. That's, that's really great. Um, can you tell us how your work relates to solving the mystery of the lost years? And for everyone that doesn't know, um, what does the lost years mean anyway? Well, the sea turtle lost years represents the time from which little baby turtles, little hatchlings, emerge from their nests that are laid on land by adult female turtles uh, along our shorelines, especially down here in Florida. And the little turtles will incubate in their nests, in their eggs. They'll eventually hatch out after maybe 50 to 70 days. And they crawl down the beach. They may imprint on the Earth's magnetic field as they're doing that, but it's a real quick time frame. Uh, they will then enter into the water, into you know a wall of ocean um, surf crashing down on these tiny little turtles that are maybe half the size of a cell phone, if that, maybe a third of the size of a cell phone. And they have a frenzy period that uh, they're using up the last of the yolk energy. They grow in their eggs around a yolk. Uh, and they will swim offshore uh, anywhere from 24 or 48 hours in this frenzy period, and then they slow down. And uh, that time frame, from the time that they get offshore to about 
two to three, maybe five to six years later, uh, is called the sea turtle lost years because these little animals are going offshore into the open ocean and staying there for, we don't really know how long, uh, before they come back to coastal habitats eventually as larger juveniles. So it would be like uh, little babies, human babies and toddlers, you know, leaving home and going far, far away for a number of years before they come back to, um, you know, habitats that may be near generally where they, where they were born or where they hatched out. So the sea turtle lost years represents kind of that lost period from our understanding. And what does the sargassum mean to these juvenile sea turtles? So what, what is important about these floating sargassum beds um, that makes them so critical for sea turtles in that period of their lives? Sargassum is really important for early life stages or the young sea turtles. Uh, not every sea turtle species needs sargassum or needs some sort of floating habitat. We do have uh, a species that's only found in Australia that doesn't even have an oceanic stage, so they're not as lost as the rest of the species. Uh, and then leatherbacks are uh, a species that we know very little about. They have a very open ocean, uh, known to be very um, oriented to live in the open ocean. We don't know where the juveniles go, so we don't really know and we don't see them, at least we haven't yet, uh, associated with sargassum. But uh, at least in the North Atlantic, uh, we have green turtles and loggerheads, uh, two of the main species that I work with. We also have some Kemp's Ridleys, which are mostly found in the Gulf of Mexico. They are found up the coast of the U.S. Uh, on the East Coast. And we also have hawksbills. And those species we have found in association with sargassum. Uh, at that life stage, during the sea turtle life year or lost years, these young turtles are mostly staying at the sea surface. Uh, they are, their lungs are fairly small, and uh, they're found at the sea surface. So if they're at the surface, they're kind of a sitting duck for all sorts of predators, birds that can be flying above, looking down and seeing them, um, especially when they're really small, they can fly down and pluck them out of the water. Uh, and eat them, or uh, other species of fish that may be circling below. So sargassum is really important for those young turtles because it provides a safe habitat for them. It provides uh, a place for them that they can rest. Uh, it provides them shelter from uh, the eyes of sharks and cobia and mahi-mahi that might be circling beneath the sargassum. They can't see them. Young turtles are often uh, camouflaged really well with their coloration in sargassum mats. Uh, but the sargassum also provides them with food. There's a lot to eat in the sargassum mats, little crabs, uh, all sorts of crustaceans, and even juvenile fish. And then in addition to that, sargassum is brown, and it provides a little bit of warmth for them too. So these turtles are cold-blooded, which means that uh, they're going to be the same temperature as the water around them. But if they're trying to grow quickly and outgrow the jaws of sharks and predators, they're going to want to be in a warm habitat that has lots of food that will kind of kickstart their metabolism and help them grow and get to the big size that they can then outswim. Or um, if they're bitten, it's not going to be fatal. And speaking of the size, I know you part of what you do is tag some of these little juvenile turtles while they're well, you find them in the floating sargassum. How do you get tags on such small and growing animals? How does that work? The tag methods that we developed were a little, they're, they're kind of funny. The, um, initially, a number of years ago, part of the reason why we call the sea turtle lost years the lost years is because we know very little about them. And one of the problems is that they these turtles are so small uh, that it's, at the time, or up until maybe about 10 years ago, tag technology wasn't small enough to be able to put a tag on a little turtle and then track where it went. Uh, the tags were bigger than the little baby turtles, so you put the tag on the turtle and they'd probably sink. But about 10, 12 years ago, something like that, the, a couple tag companies came up with some smaller solar-powered tags so by being solar powered, that meant that the tags didn't require huge you know, D-cell batteries or batteries that would take up a lot of weight and space. 
and they could then recharge. So a tag company, Microwave Telemetry, I've been working with them for a very long time. They had a 9.5 gram solar powered tag that was recently, you know, back um, when we were thinking about this in the early 2000s, uh, developed. And, <clears throat> excuse me, we ended up uh, testing these tags on turtles and tanks just to see, you know, for to glue something on a little baby turtle, we want to make sure that we're not going to be harming the turtle. We wanted to make sure that the turtles were still going to be growing and moving and swimming uh, as they should be. So I collaborated with Dr. Jeanette Weineken at Florida Atlantic University, and we went through a bunch of different tag attachment trials, and uh, we used some hard marine epoxies that work really well on large turtles where I've used in the past and tags have stayed on for four years. Uh, these are turtles that are bigger than a toilet seat, so they were fairly large animals, uh, bigger than maybe a, I don't know, 24-inch TV screen, something like that. Uh, but we had no luck. We, uh, everything that we tried by gluing onto these turtles fell off within a week or two because these turtles are growing so fast at that life stage and their shell is changing so much based on the size. I mean, when, we are the, when we're talking about these young oceanic turtles, we're talking about something that's about the size of a cereal bowl um, or a dinner plate at largest. So they're really small. And uh, so we tried all these different attachment methods, nothing worked, and we realized that the shell of the turtle was peeling every time that we would glue something on, it would um, peel as the turtle would grow, and so whatever we glued on would just fall right off. And so we were scratching our head in the lab one day, and we had the aha moment because I was admiring Jeanette's uh, pedicure that she had on her toes. She always would have little waves painted on or something like that. And we had a bit of an aha moment because sea turtle shells are the same material as our fingernails. They're made of keratin. And uh, so Jeanette whipped out her cell phone, called her manicurist, whose name is Marisol. She used to be at Just Nails in Booker Raton, Florida. I don't know if she's still there, but highly recommend her. And she ended up recommending, Marisol recommended an acrylic base coat to seal the keratin or seal the shell of the turtle. That's what she does for peeling fingernails. And so we went out to the local CVS pharmacy and picked up a nail fill kit, the, an acrylic nail fill kit, tried it out on the shells of the turtles. Sure enough, the tags that we you know, glued on stayed on for about 90 days in the lab. So it worked really well. We had a goal of keeping tags on for at least three months and we were able to do that. We did have to ensure though that we didn't use a hard epoxy because these turtles are growing. So we needed something that's flexible. And for at least the loggerheads, we uh, were able to um, use an aquarium silicone that allowed for the turtles to grow, but it also stayed attached uh, for upwards of three months. Green turtles, on the other hand, they're like little Teflon turtles. They're a little bit harder to deal with. Uh, we had to come up with something completely different, and we even took the turtles uh, to a dentist to see if we could use uh, crown adhesive to glue things in a wet environment to the back of a turtle shell. That didn't work. Uh, but we did end up with a um, 3M product that is used on boat hulls, and it works really well, and it's flexible, and uh, it lasts about just as long as the loggerhead attachment method. And we know that the attachment method for loggerheads works on a couple other species as well. Wow. That's a lot of plugs. <laughs> And oh, and I hope you get a I hope you get a manicure out of that for a uh, pedicure or something for uh, talking about them. And I'll, I uh, visit those folks. They they uh, they're helping scientists everywhere. So uh, so yeah, no, I appreciate that. Um, anyway, um, I'm just I'm I'm really tickled at your response to that question. And I'll, that's been, that's my favorite answer so far. Um, and um, so yeah, you got these turtles they're growing i guess they're sloughing off these things from time to time and all because of growth and you know how things don't fit anymore and whatnot but um so they're floating around in the sargassum and doing things do they swim and dive away from the sargassum beds or just pretty much hang out close to them because of you know the protection or whatever or are they eating sargassum or just stuff on them and around them or, or what's going on with all that 
so yes, the, the turtles are hanging out on the Sargassum. One thing to remember, though, is, and I'm sure you all know this, being the Sargassum podcast, uh, Sargassum is really transient. So it's floating around in the ocean. It's likely getting blown by wind, and it's moving with the currents. So it's a transient habitat. And it's not like studying some, say, bird species where you have a rookery and you know exactly where that rookery is. It could be in a forest or, you know, trees along a coastline. And then you can go back to that every breeding season and know exactly where to find these young birds or, you know, the adults, the adult breeders. Sargassum being much more transient, it's a lot harder to study just because it's moving all the time. And so it's a little bit like going offshore and having a needle in a haystack trying to find not only a sargassum line, but also the turtles in the sargassum, uh, because they are very cryptically um, you know, colored and they camouflage really well. So what we know about the turtles' behavior within the sargassum is limited. Uh, it's part of what my lab is looking into. We're looking at uh, the turtle's finer scale movement. I have a PhD student who's now looking at trying to get at questions looking at the finer scale movements of turtles in the sargassum and around the sargassum. Uh, we are also studying the diet and uh, a paper had been published by another group, um, but it's really one of the only ones that I know of that's available that actually studied the actual diet, like the lavage of the animals where you flush out their esophagus and pick out all the different pieces. Uh, there is sargassum that uh, has been found in those diet uh, samples, uh, but it may also just be that they're biting at something and get a little piece of sargassum at the same time. Uh, we know that they are eating uh, some of the crabs and crustaceans and little critters that live in the sargassum. But uh, what happens when the sargassum breaks up? I mean, we have these huge, beautiful mats that we find offshore, but that can change in an hour or two hours. If the wind kicks up and the seas start to um, rise a little bit, those sargassum mats break up. And then our big question is, what do those little turtles do? Because all of a sudden it's you know, almost like a tornado comes through and their home is gone. Do they hang out with a little piece of sargassum or do they move on to the next big mat? Uh, how do they find it? Um, we do think that they're likely mostly remaining at the sea surface. They're not diving that much. Uh, but we would like to get a little bit more information and maybe put some uh, tags that will give us some data on dive behavior. When we are offshore trying to chase them and dip net them to bring them on board the boat, uh, they will swim away from us. So they do uh, you know, evade us a little bit. And they also do dive a little bit, but not very far. So maybe, you know, with with their little tiny lungs, they may be limited in how far they can dive or for how long. But uh, those are all really good questions that we're still trying to answer. Well, of course they run from me. Y'all are big, scary monsters, those little guys. And all. so, um, yeah. Well, nice. Thank, yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much for that. Um, so um, that being said, with all the, the, with that sea and on shore, you know, sargassum collection devices, do you, is there a, how big is the concern for uh, sea turtles, especially these juveniles and, and, and the little guys being caught up in this as bycatch and, and them, you know, no, n never getting a reproductive opportunity, I guess is how I'd want to say that. Is that, a, is that, how, how serious is that concern? I think it's very concerning. It, Depends generally where this collection may occur uh, and what species, obviously, that would be affected and what life stages. But the thing to remember is that sea turtles are incredibly long-lived animals, and it takes them the better part of two to three decades before they mature to be able to reproduce and then contribute back into their population. So if you're collecting sargassum offshore and you're uh, also harvesting uh, young turtles, you're preventing those turtles from reaching maturity, but we may not see that reflected on nesting beaches for a couple decades. So that is concerning because we have this lag time where we could just be blissfully moving on and uh, not worried about the turtle population, and then all of a sudden, two to three decades later, 
we start to see fewer and fewer females on the nesting beach because those turtles never made it to maturity to then eventually show up on the nesting beaches. So by then it may be too late. And that's kind of the trick with, uh, or the problem with late, or late maturing, long lived animals, marine vertebrates in particular, is that uh, we, we, it's a slow science sort of approach and we need to take a longer term perspective and think longer term instead of in the immediate need, uh, perhaps human or economic need. And one thing to note is that uh, we're working in the Gulf of Mexico and we have these human perceptions of different habitats. We call oceanic habitat anything off of um, our continental shelf, which is deeper than 200 meters, say. Uh, we call open ocean um, or pelagic waters anything or anything that could be on shelf or offshore waters, but oceanic is really off that shelf water or off those shelf waters deeper in twenty deeper than twenty uh, or excuse me, the oceanic is anything deeper than two hundred meters, not twenty. <laughs> so oceanic, we define oceanic as uh, the waters that are off the continental shelf in waters that are deeper than two hundred meters. Anything on shelf waters is considered coastal or neuritic waters, anything that is shallower than 200 meters. In the Gulf of Mexico, the West Florida shelf is, it extends way far offshore. And so we have encroaching habitat such as oceanic uh, sargassum that is floating onto these shelf waters and we have these young uh, oceanic stage or lost year sea turtles that are found in those habitats that are also occurring on shelf waters. So if we have uh, the opportunity to harvest sargassum or prevent sargassum from eventually washing ashore in large blooms, like what has been happening down in the Caribbean, uh, we have to be really careful because we don't want to say, oh, it's okay to harvest the sargassum if it's already in coastal waters because we're seeing this blending of uh, occurrence of little turtles found in both oceanic and more neuritic habitats, which is unexpected, um, at least in our, you know, the way we've compartmentalized and understood our, you know, ocean habitats and the sea turtle life stage. Uh, for young turtles that are hatching out on nesting beaches, uh, if you have a huge pile of sargassum, it's worse than a, a mountain for them to try to climb. And so that can certainly prevent them from reaching the water to get offshore. So that's also a problem. Uh, so it, it's not an easy solution, uh, but I think that understanding the sea turtle life stages and the needs at each life stage and where the problem is uh, depending upon what species might be in the area and what their behavior might be, uh, needs to be taken into consideration before anything like that is implemented. Very nice. Let me, uh, you, you pointed out something that's very yeah, important. Yeah, absolutely. And, I'll, and, and, and Jenna, probably more familiar with it, maybe take this, this one comment you made for granted, but as a lobster ecologist, I, uh, I want to point this out, or I, I want you to just give me a brief response to this, because a lot of people out there, they, you know, they love sea turtles and this and this, but they don't know a lot about life history. I want to ask you about a specific point. How old are they from the time they're hatched until they become fecundant, able to reproduce? What span of time is that? You were talking about decades. Can you be a little bit more specific about that for us, please? I would love to be more specific. That is one of the biggest questions uh, with regards to sea turtle life history. Uh, we don't have a very accurate way of aging these animals. So what we do know is that they're anywhere from 25 to 35 years old at least uh, by the time they do reach maturity and come ashore to nest. There are a lot of different factors uh, that go into determining age or a ballpark age. Uh, generally speaking, because we can't identify an adult uh, unless they're you know, a female nesting on the beach, a male will uh, grow a really long tail when they reach maturity. So we can visually say, yes, that's a male, but up until the point that they do grow that tail, we don't know if they're um, a male or a female. So a female won't have that large tail. Um, and you know, 
you can look at growth rings on their humeral bones, but they reabsorb those gro growth rings. So you can't really read them like a, t uh, like a tree where you can count the different rings. Uh, so it, it, it's still a bit of a mystery. We kind of consider a lot of different factors, like size of the animal, whether they have a tail or not, whether they're mature, to identify whether they're mature. Uh, the only other possible way to identify a sex of a turtle is to do a laparoscopic um, invasive procedure or if they're dead to do a necropsy, you know, cut into them to identify the gonads. But uh, so, you know, the sex of the animal is also a big mystery as well. Uh, but age is still a little bit unknown. So knowing how old they are, how long they spend in different uh, life stage specific habitats is still a bit of a mystery. Thank you for elaborating on that. It's also, well, it's also very important in terms of, you know, population demographics and managing a species and predicting everything um, and population trajectories. But that's part of the problem of working with these animals. Okay, we, we talked a little bit about the juveniles that are affected by sargassum landings or potential landings and, and sort of a merge of habitats. Do you work with any nesting turtles that are affected by sargassum landings, or what does that look like also for a, a nesting female um, as far as dealing with the sargassum landings? The beaches that my lab monitors, uh, we monitor the central Atlantic Florida coast from uh, Kennedy Space Center and Cape Canaveral a little bit for about 50 kilometers south, a little bit less than that. Uh, <clears throat> it is one of the most densely nested uh, stretches of beaches, especially the southern portion of our nesting area, that uh, for the Western Atlantic and the Western Hemisphere even. Uh, we have, uh, in about our southern 20 kilometers of nesting beach, we have about, uh, in any given summer, we have about 12 to 15, 17,000 loggerhead nests in a 20 kilometer stretch, and anywhere from uh, five, 8,000 up to about 15, 16,000 green turtle nests. We do have some leatherbacks as well. And the thing to remember, these animals are fairly large and they're about the size of a coffee table, maybe a little bit bigger depending upon the species. And so they are fairly competent at just plowing through things. Uh, we don't have, thankfully, at least not yet, along our, on, along our nesting beach that we monitor, we don't have the huge piles and piles of sargassum that uh, some of the other beaches, uh, especially in the Caribbean, have experienced at different times. Uh, so it, I would say right now we're not having as much of an issue. We do get some sargassum uh, washing up and some rock that washes up periodically, uh, but it's not, it's not terrible. One thing that I find kind of fascinating is that we do have a seasonal movement of sargassum through the area. And curiously, and this is something that I really want some of my graduate students to think about, is that sometimes you know, the, the sargassum is moving through coincidentally at the time when a lot of turtles are hatching. And it's moving through offshore, getting transported by the Gulf Stream that runs up the coast of the US. And so that's kind of neat. And I kind of have some questions about how this evolved, this behavior evolved, among other things. Yeah, with, with sea turtles, there are definitely more questions than anything, I feel like, still. But we're making a lot of progress, so that's exciting. And your, your work is really inspiring and informative. So I really appreciate you being here today. Well, thank you so much for having me. I always love talking turtles and sargassum absolutely fa fascinates me. Yeah, th thank you so much for being with us today, Kate. I uh, want, want everybody out there to know that uh, Kate was brought up to us today by uh, the uh, Florida International University's uh, Latin, America, Latin American Caribbean Center, as well as Seafields and all. We really appreciate their support of our uh, this ongoing research that we got and sharing and learning together. Uh, I, I can't believe they're, 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 they're sponsoring the program so that I can learn stuff from some of our wonderful guests. And Kate, thank you so much for being here today. Thanks again for having me. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Wow. Yay. That was, pre that was pretty cool. You know, um, I, I, I like talking about yeah. sargassum, but I like talking about some other stuff too. And, uh, I, um, you know, I was aware of, of how long, how long lived these guys are, 
but not how long it was before they could were big enough to reproduce. That that was something I was unaware of, and um, and that was very interesting to learn today. How about you? Yeah, I really enjoyed how she was still fascinated with sarcasm after learning so much about it and still that there's more to learn. I think that's such a nice attitude to have when when people still have questions after they're continuing to learn. So that made me it, that made me feel inspired. And and she's it, she's from the southern state. So I like I like that she said y'all a couple <laughs> of times. That 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 warmed my heart a little bit mm-hmm. at all. Um Well, anyway, Jenna, and and we appreciate Kate being here today. Thank you for hanging out with us today. Thank you for being uh, part of our learning experience. And and, uh, we look forward to seeing you next week. Don't forget to like and share and send us some comments and all. We'd love to hear from you. And uh, and if you've got something that you're doing where you live, working with sargassum, let us know. There's an email down here. You might be on the podcast next week. And we'll see you then. Take care now. Bye-bye. Thank you for tuning in today and learning with us from our guests. If you want more information about what our guests talked about today, check our show notes for links and information in our archive. And don't forget to like and share our podcast with your friends. If you enjoy our podcast, please consider supporting us financially by becoming a patron. For as little as a dollar per month, you can support us and get the exclusive benefit of submitting questions for our interviewees before the interview. The Sargassum Podcast is produced by Marine Conservation Without Borders and is made possible with financial support and consideration from Seafields and the Kimberly Green Latin America and Caribbean Center, U.S. Department of Education Title VI grant. It is produced by Jose Martinez, Alex Danielli, Cleo Maradakis, Francisca Elmer, and Aloise Lopez, and is hosted by Robbie Figpen, Francisca Elmer, Jenna Cantuccio, Florence Menez, Cleo Maradakis, and Paula Diaz. We will be back in two weeks with another exciting guest. The music for the podcast is from the song Them A Pray by Drizzle, the Ron Drama, an artist from Rotan. Follow him on Spotify and YouTube for my music. But for now, this is the full song Them A Pray.